Okay, um, so Stephanie asked me to um, talk a little bit about structuring uh, a scientific article and in particular in the context of the Mapping Ancient Africa Special Issue for Quaternary International. So uh, many of you are experienced at writing papers, so this is uh, probably telling you things uh, that you might already know, but if you're not, hopefully this is just a recap of key points and ways we can do this. So the first um, thing about when I start writing a paper or you should write a paper is check the, uh, check the rules. Uh, the journals have uh, detailed uh, rules and particularly Quaternary International has a lot of rules and information on its website about how it wants to receive uh, its manuscripts. So it takes two sorts of papers, research articles or review articles. I think both are welcome within this special issue, but most of the papers we are looking at will be research articles or have some element of primary research in them. Um, but it doesn't preclude having a, a, a review article in there. In terms of word limits, Quaternary International has a maximum of 12,000 words, including references and figure captions. And to me, that's quite a big manuscript. Uh, I think for the purposes of the special issue, we're probably looking for research papers coming in at about seven or 8,000 words. Um, but if you want to write a paper that's shorter and more concise, then we're also uh, happy with that. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next few minutes or so is about how to how to keep your paper to fit that sort of word limit and how to how to write that. There are detailed guidelines on in terms of formatting in terms of setting up the referencing style. And I think Stephanie's gonna talk about that again in a little bit. Um, there's also an interesting new provision there about the use of AI, artificial intelligence in the writing process. I know some people are picking up and using this. The journal requires a declaration if you use AI in helping with the writing process. Um, and I think that's an interesting uh, uh, new addition to uh, journal guidelines or relatively recent addition to journal guidelines. So if you are using AI, there's nothing not, not necessarily wrong with that. Uh, we all use tools to help us write, um, but it does need a declaration to be aware of that. And for all that information, just go to the journal website. I've included the link there just to, to help people find that. One of the key things about Quaternary International is they very clearly state they want a particular paper stud su structure with numbered subdivisions. And so it's good to get that right when you're setting out the paper from the very start and then editors and reviewers aren't worrying about you not hitting the right format, they're worried about the contents and helping you with the science. It's pretty straightforward. Um, introduction, regional setting, materials and methods. They also have a section which you may or may not need uh, relating to archeological materials. Um, and so obviously if you don't have archeological materials in your paper, then you don't need that section. And so everything can condense up. Uh, results, discussion, conclusions, as you'd expect in a standard sort of research paper. Um, there is an option for appendices, including online appendices, where you might have additional tables, information, data sets uh, that relate to your paper, but don't fit within the regular, uh, regular part of the paper. Now, when I'm structuring uh, any sort of paper, uh, I always sort of try and set myself a series of targets for each of the sections, define the sections, how many words am I going to write within each of these different subsections? And that helps me to get a, create a balanced uh, paper. And so here I went through with this Quaternary International format and I looked at a number of their recent publications and what were the typical lengths of the sections that they had within their journal. So it's often good 
uh, to look at other papers that are published within the journal and see what uh, what is typical. And so most of the introductions were coming in between 500 and 750 words. Then a regional setting, this really varied quite widely depending on the type of paper you're writing, uh, whether it's a single study site that's quite simple, a few hundred words, to more extensive multi-region sites where there's, there's quite a lot more information. Materials and methods, likewise, that was a bit more constrained, but also, also varied a bit. The results section, it depends a bit on, on how many different uh, data sets you're presenting, but that was coming in around about a thousand words usually. And then discussion, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about what's in a discussion section, 500 to 750 words per subheading. So if you're dealing with two or three or four different topics, then that multiplies up approximately. And then a short concluding section at the end of the uh, at the end of the article really pulling together different points and so something like this and it'll vary slightly and these shouldn't be seen as strict limits like oh no I've got written 701 words how am I going to cut that out there's no ideas but just a sort of guideline as to ba basically how to set this uh, structure up And that takes you, if you take, just add those up, that takes you to already three and a half to 5,000 words, plus your dis, uh, any of these that's allowing for one discussion section, plus your figure captions, plus your references. And you're very quickly with these sorts of limits to the seven to 8,000 words that we're looking for, for the papers for this Quaternary International Special Issue. So these were kind of ballpark guidelines to get you in the zone uh, for writing papers for this special issue. Now, when you start to th think about your sections within the structure, within your sections, it's really helpful then to use a series of subheadings that really clearly lay out what you're doing. And then again, these can be, be numbered. And I just sort of came up with a, a fictitious uh, subheading set here could be a results section. Okay, so what were the sediments? How did the, we date them? What was the zonation protocol that we used? And then uh, going through your different uh, different zo uh, pollen analysis uh, zones, if it's a pollen paper, uh, which many of these, as Stephanie keeps telling us, will be uh, pollen papers. So having those subheadings in there very clearly allows you to write short sections to keep to those that structure and it allows you to uh, put those together and so remember within that section we're aiming for about a thousand words so then if you come up with your structure first you can then think okay how will i distribute those thousand words so you can go through that same exercise and it'll vary greatly depending on how many results you have or whatever how are you going to allocate those to the different sections? And what really helps with readability of a, a scientific manuscript is a kind of mirrored format, like so a repeated format across your different sections and whether that's your methods, results and discussion. I just put together uh, an idea of, of how this could look. So we have the same series of imaginary results here this is the the subheadings from your thing and then as you get to the discussion you then turn that around how do i build on that and you can see with the different color coding we have okay our, our start of it is about the sediments and things so when we get to the discussion what we're discussing is the chronology why is this reliable how do we set it up there are always different ways we can write a chronology but that's the discussion part of it as opposed to the dating or or the zonation then we get into the environmental reconstruction. So in the results, we've described what pollen is in this zone. And then you can have something that maps very clearly across in terms of the environmental interpretation, which then goes in the discussion section. And then in thinking about the implica wider implications could be the final part of your discussion. And again, these are just examples of how to do it, but using that mirrored format trick is quite a good one um, to 
uh, help that readability, help with the organization of the papers. Make it go throughout. Methods, results, discussion, all following that same sort of format. Now, how do we, we then go about writing those individual sections? So if we go into the, 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 the sections and one of the common things that I see is that the introductions get to be very long. I think if you're writing an article that's gonna come in about 7,000, 8,000 words, you can probably want to be introducing this within four paragraphs, possibly five. Um, and those four or five paragraphs really can take uh, a very formulaic approach. So the first thing to do is like, what is the problem? Why are we doing this? Why do we care about this, this particular study? What is it we're doing? That's your first paragraph, opening paragraph of that introduction. Second thing, orientate the reader, give it the key literature. How do you frame this context? Then how do we answer that? So we've got this, this, this problem, we've got this understanding, we've identified our knowledge gap. What is it that we need to know? Um, and the answer is always paleo environment, paleo climate, uh, paleo, paleo archaeology in our context. This is where we have this gap or this location uh, uh, stuff. And then the final paragraph of the introduction should really, OK, these are the key questions. These are the hypotheses that we're going to test. This is how we're going to do them. This is our approach. And you can also um, reveal this, like, what do what do our results show? So we test these hypotheses, we do this, and we show this. And one of the, I was going back when Stephanie asked you, I went back to this book, which, uh, How to Write and Publish a Scientific Paper, which is, I have the fifth edition. It's probably on about the 10th or more edition now. And I, I still go back to this because it tells you really how to pull this together. And one of the, the key points it says when writing an introduction is it says people tend to uh, write scientific papers as mystery stories. It's not a mystery story we're writing. We don't need to save the, uh, the, the answer, the big find till the end. You should, they very much advise you to state what that key finding is early on in the in the introduction so people then want to keep going on and reading to find out how you got there and to get to that point because um that's uh the, 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 that that's a, an easier more concise way of of writing these things and so you have four paragraphs and that sounds like a very small amount but you're aiming to do that within 500 to sort of 750 words so again think about like, okay, what am I going to put in these different paragraphs? What are the key bullet points? And these are the number of words that I have in each of these uh, these different uh, sections. How are you going to distribute that across uh, those, um, those paragraphs? And I do this routinely when I'm planning out a paper uh, as almost paragraph by paragraph, a set of bullet points. How is it going to come out? And if I add a paragraph in or take a paragraph out, I don't worry about it too much, but it just helps me to build that article. I'm not going to go into the same sort of detail for the, the uh, methods or results, but I do think it's worth then coming back and thinking about what goes into the discussion section. And really you want to have, uh, for these papers, I think is two or three, one, two or three, key topics that you want to address what are the what are the, the narratives that you want to discuss what are those uh, questions that you want to address in your paper and have two clear subheadings three clear subheadings that allow you to address those and make sure that they're set up in the introduction so often i'll write a paper i'll i'll, I'll write it in a sort of linear fashion and then i'll think of something else interesting when i get to the end and then you have to go back and make sure it's actually introduced uh, at the beginning and make sure that that's really clear. And I also think for the discussion, it's also really interesting to consider including a discussion figure. This could be a synthetic figure that brings in, okay, you've got all your data that you've presented in the results and puts them in the context of uh, maybe multiple lines of data if you've got different data streams that you want to bring together or in collaboration with a bunch of different authors. So like put that together so you've got a discussion figure. Or this could be a, a sort of synthetic illustrative um, figure. I mean, I was looking at 
the paper by Alice that she's thinking about putting in here. And at the end, she has a model of lake dynamics where she shows the different sites, lake states in presumptively and the different mercury concentrations and how does this come together. And so you might want to think about having a conceptual figure in that discussion section as well. So, and remember, so you're aiming to get sort of 500, 750 words per section. So that's sort of a thousand words if you've got two sections uh, or one and a half thousand words if you've got three sections, if you're going to the shorter end of this, making sure you've got those things across in a punchy way. Finally, on the, uh, the structure, I thought it's worth, particularly for Quaternary International, thinking about what the, how many figures do you want to include? What figures should there be in, a, in the sort of paper that we're expecting? As far as I can see, reading the journal guidelines, there is no strict limit to the number of figures. Um, I did see papers with nine or 10 figures in there, but, uh, or as low as two. Uh, but most of the papers that I, I, I clicked on had around six figures in there, and they typically followed this selection uh, of types of figures. There was typically a map locating your stuff, uh, and the figure two was like giving some more information about the study region, photographs, uh, more location type uh, figure. Then the sediment description, age versus depth plot. This is the material we got. Uh, and then stratigraphic plot, pollen diagram, diatom diagram, whatever it is that the, the, the data set you're presenting. Then some sort of multivariate analysis and then some sort of conceptual and synthetic figure. And so I think for most of the papers that we're likely to receive or would like to receive this kind of selection of figures, and I'm not putting any hard and fast limits on things here, obviously, is the sort of selection we would fit, think of. I think with some of the more map orientated where we have um, past claims spitting out lots of spatial maps, I think that's great. I think one thing to think about in that context is which are the key sets of maps. And I'd like to see potentially, I, I don't know, a full page figure of a whole series of, uh, of maps might be really, really nice to show, but maybe there's other versions of that which can go in supporting online material or appendices and thinking about that, that balance between uh, the figures that are, are really critical for the narrative and those that are, uh, uh, are supporting ideas. Um, and that was that was sort of the end of the the presentation as I had it. Um, I'm very happy to take questions, comments, thoughts uh, on this or any areas that people want to go into more detail. So, um, Stephanie, questions? Anybody? I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. Um, uh, I have to change the, the thing. Okay. So no, thank you very very much for the really nice presentation. I think that gives a really nice overview of what Cordner International wants and what we should try to deliver, um, which means all of us that are involved within the special issue. Um, again, we will put this on the Slack channel, so you are on the YouTube channel, depending on, so making sure it's accessible, so you can always go back to it. Like, as I said, we'll kind of like manage me through the PMS paper with exactly what he just did and said, and that helped me personally a lot, structuring the paper this way. So from own personal experience, it helped me a lot to do to keep it like this and do it like this. So um, are there any other questions from the other folks that are still around? Or other tips and tricks? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to really kindly could mention something about uh, referencing. Ah, uh, yeah. So the journal format is uh, is very specific and getting those lined up is is quite important and um, i th think stephanie is going to talk a little bit about mendeley in yes. a moment as okay. to how to do that i use through the university we can get ref works which allows me to just put those in as I go along and, and manages it into a database manually doing references at the end is uh, a bit of a nightmare. So I think if you can get into one of these uh, referencing tools, then that's 
that's will save you time. Uh, and I think Stephanie will have some specific further information on that in about, well, a few minutes time. Yes, exactly. So Rob, um, you can come back to the question because I'll, I'll also go to what exactly the citation style for Quaternary International is going to have to look mm -hmm. specifically. So okay. we'll get to that in a second. Um, are there any other questions from the rest in terms of what Will said uh, in terms of structure and layout of the paper and how you can do it or other tips and tricks? Nope. In which okay. case, um, why don't you switch off your presentation? No. Are you going to stop the recording and then we can put them on as individual things? Yes, I can do that. Hang on. So I'm going to stop recording.